Paulo. Well, again, Snehal has hit the nail on the head, as we say, when she talks about my interest in atrioventricular septal defect. This is perhaps the lesion that I've been most closely involved with over the years, and it's also the lesion that I've been most gratified to note that the concepts that we put forward concerning this entity are now so widely ex accepted. So what is atrioventricular septal defect with common atrioventricular junction? It certainly wasn't that when I started my career. You know as well as I do that it's also known as an atrioventricular canal defect. In fact, there's nothing wrong with calling it atrioventricular canal defect because in essence, it is persistence of the embryonic atrioventricular <coughs> canal. It includes what many call an ostium primum atrial septal defect. And there lies the rub, because the ostium primum defect is not, in fact, an atrial septal defect. It, too, as I will show you, is an atrioventricular septal defect. Now, in the past, it used to be called the endocardial cushion defect. Now, I was asked in the previous session about the search for the genetic background of these things. And for 40 years, the developmental biologists have been looking at the atrioventricular cushions, and they have not been able to find the reason why we have this lesion. And that is because it's nothing to do with the endocardial cushions. In fact, the cushions may not fuse, but they can fuse. And we still have atrioventricular septal defect with common atrioventricular junction. But the genetics, the embryology, are of less concern with us than the phenotypic feature, because the key to diagnosis of the lesion and its anatomic variants is understanding the phenotype. And the phenotypic feature, unequivocally, is the common atrioventricular junction. And I've made the point about not mixing apples with oranges. And there is as much difference between AV septal defect and hearts with separate right and left AV junctions as there is between apples and oranges. So the final part of Dr. Deshpanda's presentation to you this morning was to emphasize the three orthogonal planes of the heart. And that's how we analyze these things echocardiographically. And she introduced you to the four-chamber, the long axis, and the short axis cuts through the heart. And if we are to understand the anatomy of atrioventricular septal defects, we need to understand what's going on in all of these planes. Dr. Rao, in his presentation, pointed out that as morphologists, we use long incisions to open up the heart or to produce these sections. I, in fact, wish the opposite that what he suggested I wish. We could look in the heart without making incisions at all. And as I'm going to share with you this afternoon, we can now do that using virtual dissection. And I think that is the essence of tomorrow's cardiac anatomy. But for the present, we use the sectioning of the planes, such as Dr. Deshpanda showed you. And these lovely images that I use are all taken by Diane Spicer. She's a pathologist assistant with whom I work from Tampa. She's a consummate anatomist in her own right. So here you see a normal heart. We've positioned it in attitudinally appropriate fashion. And the essence of normality is the separateness of the two atrioventricular junctions. And between them, as I will show you when we look at the specimen afterwards, we have the separating septal areas. And all that is deficient when we have the common atrioventricular junction. And as we'll also see, that common atrioventricular junction is an all-or-none phenomenon.
But not only do we have a common atrioventricular junction, we also have an atrioventricular septal defect. And the atrioventricular septal defect is the space between the leading edge of the primary atrial septum and the scooped out crest of the muscular ventricular septum. And it's the combination of those two entities that produce atrioventricular septal defect with common atrioventricular junction. Now the thing that is lacking in that, again as Dr. Dashpanda emphasized for you, is the wedging of the aorta. So in the normal heart, you have separate atrioventricular junctions because the subaortic outflow tract is interposed between the mitral valve and the ventricular septum. And again, in keeping with that arrangement, in hearts with separate atrioventricular junctions, there is unity between the inlet and outlet dimensions of the ventricular mass. That too is totally different when we have atrioventricular septal defect with common atrioventricular junction. And now when we look at the situation, the parasternal long axis arrangement, we can beautifully see how the subaortic outflow tract is no longer wedged between the common junction and the septum. And in keeping with this, we now have inlet-outlet septal disproportion. And that inlet-septal disproportion is a feature of the overall group of atrioventricular septal defects. And the thing that distinguishes between them is the extent of scooping. The word scooping we use to describe this bowed configuration of the ventricular septum. Note, if you would, but in this image, where the double-headed red arrow is showing you the plane of the atrioventricular junction, that there is a significant component of the atrioventricular septal defect that is on the atrial aspects of the valvar leaflets, but is below the level of the atrioventricular junction. And when those leaflets come together during ventricular systole, shunting can take place through that component of the atrioventricular septal defect at atrial level, even though it is below the plane of the atrioventricular junction. And that is why, in the osteum primum defect, as we will discuss, the problem is an atrioventricular septal defect and not an atrial septal defect. But we complete our analysis of these hearts by looking at the short axis section. So here is the short axis of the normal atrioventricular junctions. And again, you see how the subaortic outflow tract is wedged between the mitral valve and the septum. And now we can see the atrioventricular septal structures. And the key atrioventricular septal structure is the atrioventricular septal part of the membranous septum. We used to think that this inferior margin of the ventricular septum was also part of an atrioventricular septal component. We now know that that is not the case because there is a cranial continuation of the inferior atrioventricular groove that interposes between the right atrial vestibule and the summit of the ventricular mass. And that is an area that Yash is particularly concerned about because that inferior pyramidal space harbors the atrioventricular node and is an area where he conducts so many of his electrophysiological investigations. But all of that is missing when we have atrioventricular septal defect with common atrioventricular junction. And beautifully, once more in the short axis, we see the unwedging of the left ventricular outflow tract. So from all of those, we know that the phenotypic feature is the common junction. Now I also know that all of you in this room will talk about partial and complete variants of atrioventricular septal defect. But what I want to stress 
is that although you divide the hearts into partial entities, complete entities, the phenotypic features are the same. There is not partial or completeness of the phenotypic features. And we know that because a very long time ago, when I was working in Amsterdam with Anton Becker, we took this heart, and you can immediately recognize that you're looking at the left ventricular aspect of the septal surface, and you can see the scooped out margin of the ventricular septum, and you see, unequivocally, there is inlet-outlet disproportion. But what we have done here, we have stripped away the valva leaflets. And it was doing that that brought home to us the fact that when you take away the valves, you have no way of knowing whether you have, as clinicians would have called this a partial or a complete defect. And we then extended this observation using the archive at Pittsburgh, where we measured the extent of inlet-outlet disproportion where we have a common valve, or when we have the osteum premium defect. And there is no statistical difference between the two. And that is hardly surprising, because when we look down on the atrioventricular junctions from the atrial aspect, and we look at the example that has a common atrioventricular junction, but also with a common valvar orifice, we see this figure of eight configuration that is part and parcel of the phenotypic features. Now I want you to retain that pattern in your mind, because I'm now going to show you a comparable dissection made from a patient who has a so-called partial defect. This, with common valvar orifice, is the complete defect. All comfortable with that? So let's look at the alleged partial defect. Is there any difference in the arrangement of the common atrioventricular junction? Is there any difference in unwedging of the aortic outflow tract. You be the judge. It is surely virtually the same as what I showed you a moment ago with common valve. Yes? What we see, however, is that the difference in this heart, which is an osteum premium defect, is that along the plane of the ventricular septum, there is a tongue of valvar tissue that has joined together two of the leaflets that bridge the ventricular septum. And so all we are looking at is dual orifice common atrioventricular valve. The essence of the osteum premium defect is separate valve orifices for the two ventricles. So there is no difference in inlet-outlet septal disproportion there is no difference in the degree of aortic unwedging. The phenotype is one and the same. But you all know better than I, when the patients are facing you in the consulting room, or when you are doing echocardiography, there are fundamental differences between the patients that together make up the group. So what is the variability what should we be concentrating upon when we describe partial versus complete defects? First of all, the arrangement of the valvar leaflets to each other. Second, the arrangement of the septal structure. And third, the commitment of the common junction. So what I'm now going to do is to dissect for you the arrangement of the common valve and show how it can be divided to produce separate valvar orifices. So this is the echocardiographic view of the common of the atrioventricular junctions. This is the sternocostal surface, this is the posterior surface, this is anterior, then this is posterior. So let's put in the plane of the ventricular septum. And we know then that the common atrioventricular valve has two leaflets that are confined within the right ventricle. 
and they are located inferiorly and anteroperiorly. But the key to the valve is the two leaflets that bridge the ventriculate septum. And echocardiographically, and with the heart in attitudinally appropriate position, they bridge superiorly and inferiorly. And then the final leaflet of the valve is confined to the left ventricle, but unlike the normal mitral valve, which Dr. Deshpande showed you so beautifully this morning, the mural leaflet of the mitral valve guards less than one-third of the overall circumference of the common valve, guards less than one-third of the overall circumference. And that raises a major controversy. But what are we to call the space between the left ventricular component of the bridging leaflets? And in fact, it is a zone of apposition. It is not a cleft in a mitral valve. And we can take the so-called Rastelli classification as a validation of the fact that it is a zone of apposition. Because you know that in the Rastelli classification, we have type C, when the superior bridging leaflet extends well into the right ventricle, and reciprocally, the anterosuperior leaflet of the right ventricle is small. There is then a spectrum of malformation. As the superior leaflet bridges less, the anterosuperior leaflet gets larger, with type B in the middle, and type A, when the superior bridging leaflet barely gets in to the right ventricle, and the anterosuperior leaflet of the right ventricle is of considerable size. My observations now indicate that you can continue the spectrum of the Rastelli classification. Because the osteum primum defect is no more than a Rastelli type A with a bridging tongue between the two superior leaflets, the two bridging leaflets, which are also usually attached to the crest of the muscular ventricular septum. So the osteum primum defect is just a little more along the Rastelli classification, but with that connecting tongue. Separate orifices within the common junction, and that tells us that the space between the left ventricular component of the bridging leaflets and the osteum primum defect is a zone of apposition between those leaflets, just as it is with common atrioventricular valve. Now, Snehal was kind enough to refer to one of the papers I wrote with my very good friend and colleague, Benson Wilcox, who sadly himself has now passed away. This is one of the wonderful pictures taken by Dr. Wilcox in the operating room. And those of you who are surgeons will immediately recognize what you see in atrioventricular septal defect. The valve guarding the left atrioventricular junction is a trifoliate structure. It closes in trifoliate fashion. It is fundamentally different from a mitral valve because it has never been a mitral valve and no matter what you do as surgeons, you can never make it into a mitral valve because its mural component guards less than one-third of the overall circumference of the left half of the common atrioventricular junction. The space between those left ventricular components is a zone of apposition, and we now know from extensive clinical experience that you may need to close that zone of apposition so as to make the new left valve competent, but in so doing, you have not produced a mitral valve. You have modified the trifoliate left valve. So let's move on and let's look at the relationship between the leaflets and the septum, because it is that that determines the potential for shunting. And I'm going to draw your attention here, that on occasion, there may be no potential of shunting. And it's a privilege for me to say that today I'm going to be able to show you such a heart.
I've never been able to say that before. I've seen such hearts before, but I've never had them at my fingertips to be able to show the audience. So it's particularly pertinent today that we look at the variability for shunting across the atrioventricular septal defect. And I'm going to show you hearts in which the bridging leaflets float, and then you have shunting at atrial level, and you have shunting at ventricular level. But this is not an atrial septal defect. It is shunting at atrial level through an atrioventricular septal defect because the atrial septum can be intact in these settings. And this is not a ventricular septal defect. It is shunting at ventricular level through the ventricular component of an atrioventricular septal defect. So if you're going to take away one thing from what I say to you today, please remember that shunting at atrial or ventricular level through the atrioventricular septal defect is not the same thing as atrial and ventricular septal defects. You'll find the rest of the world describing them as atrial and ventricular septal defects, but they are wrong. So you should be taking the lead in correcting them. You can then see that if we go back to our atrioventricular septal defect and we attach the bridging leaflets firmly to the crest of the ventricular septum, shunting will be possible only at atrial level. And that is the osteum primum defect, but again, it is not an atrial septal defect. It is atrial shunting through an atrioventricular septal defect. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. So you will then appreciate that when we go back to our atrioventricular septal defect and we attach the bridging leaflets to the undersurface of the atrial septum, you will have shunting through the ventricular component of an atrioventricular septal defect. A close cousin of ventricular septal defect, but an atrioventricular septal defect with exclusively ventricular shunting. You will not then be surprised, or at least you may be surprised, but in a few minutes' time you will not be surprised when we show you one of Pradeep's wonderful hearts in which there has been spontaneous closure of an atrioventricular septal defect. Now we have no potential for shunting, but still, as you will see, there will be a trifoliate left AV valve. So the other things, ventricular imbalance, we can have right ventricular dominance. The key then is the area of the left AV valve or left ventricular dominance. And the situation there is analogous to straddling tricuspid valve. Because if we move our ventricular septum across, we have right ventricular dominance. My cartoon is wrong here, because that should move with it. And the end point of right ventricular dominance is double inlet right ventricle through a common valve. On the other hand, when you have left ventricular dominance, then you truly do have malalignment between the septal structures. And the end point of that is double inlet left ventricle with common valve. Don't forget the associated malformations because the common AV junction can coexist with tetralogy or double outlet. It's particularly prone to obstructions in the left ventricular outflow tract and we can have dual orifices in the left AV valve. So here is another of Diane Spicer's lovely pictures showing you common AV valve overriding aorta, malaligned muscular outlet septum, tetralogy of fallow. Here's the situation where we have double outlet right ventricle in association with atrioventricular septal defect, putting the defect in non-committed position. Now with regard to dual orifice left AV valve, I've told you how the common, the ostium primum lesion is no more than dual orifice common AV valve. So you won't be surprised to know that if you have additional tongs of tissue, we can then have dual orifice 
in the left atrioventricular valve. Easy. The atrioventricular conduction axis, we're going to concentrate tomorrow on the atrioventricular conduction tissue, both in the normal heart, in Epstein's malformation, and congenitally corrected transposition. It's also a little bit different in atrioventricular septal defect, because the node is no longer at the apex of the triangle of cock. It's formed at a nodal triangle where the ventricular septum meets the atrioventricular junction. The good news for the surgeon in this regard is that the left ventricular outflow tract no longer harbors the left ventricular bundle branch. So this is a very beautiful heart because it shows you the integrity of the atrial septum in the setting of an ostium primum defect. And look, you can see there is a triangle of cock. The leading edge of the atrial septum, the tendon of Todoro, still configure a triangle of cock. It's an analog of the triangle of cock. The conduction axis is no longer in there. Instead, the atrioventricular node is formed inferiorly where the ventricular septum meets the atrioventricular junction. And usually that coincides with the primary septum, so that we can now create a nodal triangle where we find the atrioventricular node. The bundle branches are no longer related to the aortic root. But when we have left ventricular dominance, there is malalignment between the primary atrial septum and the ventricular septum. And that means the coronary sinus is no longer a guide to the location of the conduction system. And instead, the septum and the non-branching bundle meet the atrioventricular junction away from the crooks. And that is where we find the atrioventricular node. So the key to finding the atrioventricular node is to find the point at which the ventricular septum meets the atrioventricular junction. So that is the conclusion of my PowerPoint presentation to you. We're going very shortly to look at some exquisite hearts that in fact will show better the anatomy than my picture shown you. What I'm going to emphasize again is that the phenotypic feature of these hearts is the commonality of the atrioventricular junction. What I'm going to show you is that it is the relationship between the bridging leaflets of the valve and the septal structures that determines the potential for shunting. But the take-home message, the one feature that permits you reliably to diagnose atrioventricular septal defect even when there has been spontaneous closure of the defect is that the left AV valve is trifoliate it is not a mitral valve, and you can talk about a cleft, if you will, between inverted commas, but much better, I think, to talk about the zone of apposition between the left ventricular components of the bridging leaflets. So I'll move over now to the table, and I'll demonstrate the hearts with atrioventricular septal defect.